Hey there, you big phonies. You are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me today, Mr. Ashley Hatter. How are you doing, Ashley, old kid? Oh, you know, it, it's really good to know you. It really is. Really there are is? other people I say I don't like them. I don't like listening to them. But you, I really like it. I really do. <laughs> is that how Holden Caulfield sounds? <laughs> is that a pitch voice? Yeah, that's that's totally in my head the entire time. I'm really trying to adjust that, but I'm just like, oh, yeah. I always oh thought God. of him as uh, more of like an old-timey newsy kid. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I don't know, like the shitty New York accent. I, I'm not, I don't know New York, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how they talk. For you folks just tuning in, we are going to actually talk about the catcher and the rye, not just half partially... I don't know. We might not even talk about it long after we get irritated, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, the, the Catcher in the Rye, the timeless tale of Holden Caulfield, a young, <clears throat> angsty teenager of 16 or 17, who, after flunking out of, what, his fourth or fifth private school, he uh, spends a couple days in New York. Because back in the 50s, you could be underage, just go to New York City, drink all you want, and at most, they'll just give you a Coca-Cola. But... Other mm. places he gets served because he has grain hair and he's tall. Um, <laughs> he also picks up a prostitute who he does not have sex with and then gets mildly beat up by the the uh, elevator operator slash pimp. I forget that guy's mm. name. Maurice, Mar- Marcio, or Marco. What is his name? Maurice. Uh, Maurice. Mar- Maurice, yeah. Mauricio, I think it's Maurice. Something like that. That's something stupid. He had a Some flabby stomach. and he, Yeah, he had a flabby stomach and he beat up Holden Caulfield. Mildly, he like punched him in the gizzard and. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, I hate these goddamn updates. Hold on, I gotta hit that before the computer blows up. Sorry, uh, we're so rudely interrupted by computer problems again. That's gonna be a weekly theme here. Um, <laughs> so Holden Caulfield, where were we? He got beat up by a pimp that might have been named Maurice. He uh, stays up way too late, goes to a bunch of bars, has really. Really stupid conversations with cab drivers about ducks, and uh, <laughs> and he uh, ends up after another series of drinking and getting uh, I forget what term he uses, but he got drunk like a madman, and then he ends up going back to uh, which also that fucking phone he says drunk he never really gets drunk it doesn't bother him but then he clearly gets drunk and it affects him but um oh, yeah. he uh, ends up talking to his little sister. Which gave me a little weird vibe there, but maybe that's just because it was written in the 50s. Like, the way he was describing, the way she looked and stuff. And then they end up on a goddamn carousel, and he's sitting in the rain like a fucking tool, and then it's over. So let's break this down into, uh... (laughs) you know what, before we go into anything, we had this big grand idea, you see, that Mm. Ashley and I, what we would do... (laughs) We would do a shot of hard liquor every time the word phony or phonies came up in this story. Now, I kept track of as I was reading this wonderful tale. And what I came up with, (laughs) out of 277 pages, we have 49 phonies. So I feel feel like that's doable. We got... 49 people and gave them each a shot you know it's just well halfway through this we were talking about doing half <laughs> shots because it would be too much and then we were talking about beer shots and it's still too much if we each <laughs> did one shot and we we cut the list in half so we only you took 25 i took 25 we would still die so <laughs> if we did if we did half shots and did the same thing we would still be drinking like 12 or 13 full shots each. So it's just, yes. it's not going to happen, folks. I'm sorry if it's not as entertaining <laughs> as you expected, but that, that's a, that's a no go. And I'm really glad I didn't go with the, uh, do a shot every time he says, God damn, because oh we would have been, uh, mortally injured. Our livers would have rotted out immediately. Cirrhosis would have yeah. kicked in and that would only be by page 10. Yeah, I'm, I mean, my, mine's still barely kicking right now, and it's like, God, God damn it, Ashley, you have pity on me. You can take it. Take it all. Take it. Mm-hmm. So they're Ackley kid, you, you goddamn prince. You really are. Um, <laughs> Gosh, that guy was gross. Okay, so I'm going to do the old compliment sandwich <laughs> for the book, okay. which I think we might have did for House of Leaves, too. I will I will start by saying 
the underlying part of the story was kind of beautiful in that the like what's it's almost an afterthought but what clearly drives the whole story is holden caulfield's uh was he his younger brother or older brother Allie? i thought it was alfie Alfie. Maybe it was Ali. Something like that. I think it was Ali. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a younger brother. He was younger by two years, I think is what he said. Well, he so ends, they're pretty close in age. Yeah, so he ends up dying, and then Holden Caulfield, that's where his downward spiral starts. That He breaks his hand, punching out all the windows in his garage, and and that seems to be where like the flunking out of school kind of on purpose starts. And clearly, that's where his depression lies, is with his younger brother's death. Yeah. So if you look at it from that perspective, the whole story makes a lot more sense. It's not just some angsty, annoying teenager. It's somebody that's suffering with mental illness and depression. Oh, was I supposed to say something? I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's generally how back and forth go, but no. <laughs> it, oh, it, yeah. it doesn't really matter. <laughs> But uh, so you get that aspect of it. So I actually like that. And I kind of wish that was more important to the story, or at least as uh, Holden Caulfield goes around his, with his boring narration of stuff. You also get his societal views and about the phonies. And then we might I think we covered some of that last episode with the uh, like the time period and stuff. But it, it's like mm-hmm. the counterculture aspect. You can see and all teenagers seem to go through that. And then we have a yeah. lot of. Uh, from the people I spoke with, it seems like they read it when they were a teenager, so it hit them differently than us reading it as adults, who we kind of just see yeah. this whiny, annoying kid. But you uh, texted me that you might have had a change of heart with the story? Uh, change of heart's a strong, strong term. I, I don't know I have a change of heart. No, I think, in, um, I just, I think because I'm reading it at a slower pace, it gave me time to digest certain aspects. And so like the, the depression thing is uh, like sometimes it's heavy handed. Um, I think other, like when he just goes on these spiels and keeps hearkening back to his uh, dead brother and everything. And like, Oh yeah. And he's dead. Oh, my brother, the dead one. So I'm like, okay. So yeah, that the depression's obviously there. Um, I thought it was interesting. uh, His interaction with Sally after they had skated around and, you know, I, I saw her in that, you know, really short dress showing off her butt. And she was always doing that and all that um, <laughs> when they're sitting down talking and he wants to like move. He wants her and him to move to like Vermont and get a cabin in the woods and all that stuff. Um, Very half cocked uh, plan he had there. Yeah, he it wasn't well thought out. But at the moment, what struck me is, is like he meant it when he said it. And then looking back on it as he's narrating everything, he didn't mean it. And he's like, no, why would I suggest something like that? And so that kind of gave me like uh, almost a manic vibe. He uh, has that a like lot a, in this. He has these yeah. where he always says, I meant it when I said it, but he didn't act like when he tells girls he loves them or he feels like he loves them. He loves them yeah. in the moment. And then after the moment passes, he doesn't feel that way anymore. So that's yeah, very so like, it, bipolar-ish. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a like an ADHD uh, manic sort of thing that and that kind of stood out to me. I was like, OK, if I if I look at it in that light, then it's a little easier to kind of tolerate his uh, his narrations and, you know, understand the fact that he like flip flops on a bunch of crap, you know, calling certain people phonies. But then he's like, oh, but I like this, too. I'm like, OK, that means you're a phony, dude. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's, uh, you know, it just uh, a change of heart still a heavy term, but you, you know, don't necessarily can... want to burn the book again. No, I, I don't think I'll burn it this time. Maybe metaphorically. I'll do a metaphorical burning, if you know what I mean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go. Well, you know, with the toilet paper uh, scarcity right now, <laughs> this book might come in handy. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, this might not be an app comparison, but with, when you were talking about the narration, I kind of got a feel of uh, the first half of Notes of the Underground from Dostoevsky, where that obviously that was better done, but it's the narrator <laughs> just kind of ranting and almost being annoying because you just get the narrator's point of view and he's kind of unreliable and there's nothing like you don't get anybody else's perspective. That's what you get a lot with Holden Caulfield. You get this uh, this self obsessed narration where it's. He doesn't really talk about how others feel or even how he makes others feel if it doesn't involve how he feels himself. So he's not really able to view, like, say, if he upsets somebody, he'll talk about 
them being upset, but it's about how he upset them. It's not about why they're upset necessarily. Yeah. It's about his selfish reasoning and how it makes him feel depressed when they get upset at him. Again, that I mean, a lot of teenagers are kind of like that, so I understand, but it is really annoying to read at times. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's it's like he's. I, I think I I tweeted it at one point. I was like, Holden Caulfield was emo before emo was even considered because yeah. he's like he's obsessed with being sad and depressed. And yeah, I realize there's an underlying actual depression because of his brother's death and how that affected him. But at the same time, he'll be like, oh, yeah, I saw all these girls standing around at the theater and, you know, I was checking them out and having a great time, if you know what I mean. And then I got really depressed thinking about where they would end up, you know, ending up with these lousy guys and all this stuff. And, you know, it just really made me depressed or seeing the nuns with the basket. And yeah. Like, oh, it made me depressed thinking about it. I was like, I think it's, it's stealing a line from Princess Brad. I don't think that word means what do you think it means. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're uh, you're. You're attributing such a, you know, to use their terminology, a grand emotion mm-hmm. uh, with, you know, you're just, you're empathizing. It's called sympathy, dude. And like, you're, yeah. you're sympathizing with them, but it's, it, that doesn't mean you're depressed. So, well, after I finished this, I was reflecting on the actual character of Holden Caulfield. And until you read the book, you just hear about him being whiny and then it's either people identify with them or they don't. Well, after reading, I don't identify with him, but I can see where he's coming from, and he is a complex character. You know, for instance, a lot of the story is pretty much, you know, a coming-of-age story, but it's about him not wanting to lose that childhood innocence. Like, that is the whole thing with the carousel and the little girl riding it and uh, his little sister. And he uh, goes a lot about, like, how life is for his little sister, and he does do good things in this uh, in the story. He gives money to the nuns, and he wanted to give more money mm-hmm. He wants to pay for people's drinks and their food. He uh, buys his sister a record, and then when he accidentally breaks it in his drunken stupor, he feels super, super bad about it. Yeah. He always seems like he wants to do the right thing by people, but goes about it in the most annoying, worst possible <laughs> way, and ends up just offending the shit out of him. He does it with the girls yeah. he talks to. He does it with his little sister at the end. He does it with everybody. But I can see like why people would like him, because it underneath he does seem like he has a good heart, but you can see with his brother's death and everything and his depression and then just the normal teenage angst, it that seems to show through more than the, the good things he does. Um, obviously, the, there's a couple teacher characters. One might be a pervert, uh, Flitty, as he <laughs> refers to him, which would be a gay person, apparently. I didn't know that was a, a slur for gay people back then. There you go. But uh, he <laughs> there's a couple teachers, though. And they might actually be, I think they're both English teachers, because apparently he's good at writing like his older brother, who's a Hollywood phony writer. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Prostituting himself out. (laughs) Yeah, but he um, is very skilled at that, apparently. And then there's other references to like him writing compositions, or the one guy asked him to write an essay for him, and just things like that, because he's good at it. So you have people who really care about him and want him to do well, and he just does it because... I don't know if it's he's, he's rebelling or he just self-sabotaging, whatever it is. I mean, he's very ham-fisted with how he goes about narrating things. But I don't know that you can necessarily hate the character unless you just kind of ignore the good parts of the character. Which is, with every with anybody, it's hard to do that unless you're just kind of a douche. You, you don't want to just focus on one aspect of a person. You, it's about their whole life and how they treat others and how... Like, if he treated everybody like garbage, and then he had that personality, I would see completely hating the character. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, he he is more complex. I, I didn't... I think what riles me up when people use the term coming-of-age uh, tale or coming-of-age story or whatever is it doesn't feel like that to me. Like, he's... I, I definitely see and can identify the struggle with, you know the fact that he has to grow up and everything because rather than get a job, he hates the thought of getting a job, which any sane individual to me would also hate growing up and working in a corporate atmosphere. But, uh, you know, rather than do that, he, you know, let's, let's go run off to a cabin in Vermont or something like that. But, uh, you see that anytime he's around like little kids or people younger than him, or he goes to the museum and everything's the exact same as like when he was growing up, um, he has like these really nostalgic things and that's when his demeanor softens the most. Yeah. 
I think he he gets out of his head for a minute and is you able. You can see to, his innocence still is there and still intact. Yeah, he. It's like he doesn't want to grow up, but by the end of the book, even with the carousel uh, scene, he still hasn't grown up. He's. I think maybe he's become aware of a certain thought, but I was like, if that's at the very very end, I wouldn't say that this is a coming of age thing. I think this is more just a an adolescent tale. This is like, um, you know, when Tom Sawyer, uh, Mark Twain cut off before Tom grew up because he's like, well, then it wouldn't be a chi- uh, a story about childhood. It's either a story about childhood or it's a story about becoming an adult. And so he's like, we're going to cut it off here before Tom grows up. And I feel like that's kind of what Catcher in the Rye was. It's they, they cut it off, you know, Salinger cut it off while he's still a kid. Well, you know, he's he's still this young guy that's struggling with growing up but it's not like he's embraced it and is stepping into being an adult that that coming of age sort of thing taking on that responsibility he's just you know watching his sister ride a carousel while he sits in the rain and the sh- smokes the sh- too much <laughs> the story, he smoked a fucking lot oh my gosh for a 16 year old too but um <laughs> a story that's only set in two or three days it can't really be a coming of age tale it's just that's yeah that's not gonna that's work another thing. i mean he does go with the flashbacks of when he was younger and stuff with his brother but it doesn't really go into that too much yeah i mean what other what was the significance of the ducks about them where do they go in the winter time because that was something that seemed like it should have been a throwaway line but then he had like a fight with one cab driver about it and then talked with another cat like he was obsessed with these fucking ducks i was like why yeah I think maybe it was to illustrate the fact that he's still like a kid wondering about kid things Mm -hmm. It, it just didn't come across as that. It just, to me, came across as like either he's trying to piss somebody off or he has a mental disability and just can't figure out the ducks fly somewhere else. Yeah. Like, well, he even says, they, do they fly south or something? Well, clearly, that would be the answer, right? It's like, they have wings, dude. You you see them flying. Like, it's not like they're bound to the water. Yeah. They're not fish. I, I mean, he even goes blind drunk into Central Park at night in the wintertime. Or what, you know, at least it was very cold out, and it almost falls in the water searching for these fucking ducks. I, who cares, man? <laughs> like, yeah, that, that's something that escapes with it. me. Yeah, I, 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 like, I tried to look it up, and I wasn't able to find a, a conclusive answer to that. Yeah, it's because you're you're looking at all the phony sites. All the phony sites are going to tell you phony things. Speaking don't of, don't you know this kid? Speaking of phonies, we'll get into how obviously Holden Caulfield is one of the phonies because that's how it ends is, Oh yeah, this guy's a phony too, but cause he's very hypocritical. He does all the things like he hates movies. He goes to the movies like fucking stupid. Yeah. He goes all the time. I was like, hates Dude, movies, but he's always him. going. <laughs> oh man. I hate him. I was like, it just sounds like you're, you haven't seen anything you like, but even then it was like he, him going to the plays and the movies. He's still like, Oh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't my favorite, but yeah. you know, I was just like, Dude, <laughs> he does that throughout the whole book. He he will rant about something, yeah. and then he does the same fucking thing. But anyway, going back to the actual phonies, I was reading some of the different reviews for this to see like what other people got out of it. And there's a, again a lot of arguing, which I always find strange with a book this old. Is why are you fighting about Holden Caulfield? Like, I can understand a civil discussion. Why it's like if you say you hate the kid, we've encountered this. You say you hate it, all of a sudden you get people you know messaging you. <laughs> Asking yeah. you why you hated it. And uh, I'm sure you probably got, I got at least five people do that to me. And I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. I didn't even read the whole thing yet when I tweeted. I just said, Holden Caulfield's whiny. And then, well, well you don't want what you're not seeing is he's angsty, but he's only because, and it's like, I don't give a fuck. It's like you'd think that we just insulted Christ or yeah. Muhammad or something like that. It's like, dude, he's he's a he's a teenager with gray hair. I don't know. It's, like, it's not that big of a deal, man. What do you What do you want from me? Just because I don't like it doesn't mean I'm personally attacking you for liking it. But anyway, yeah. I was reading the reviews to see why people were on that side in a less, at least not direct, because I wasn't talking to them, so they weren't directing their anger towards me. They were directing it towards <laughs> the reviewers. But regardless, um, I got a lot of really, again, back to Scrody McBooger balls. People were seeing <laughs> things in this fucking book that there's so many vast differences in what people were seeing that obviously all of them can't be right if any of them were. I got – it was actually the whole thing's about World War II. Um, I got Holden is yeah. in a mental institution and that's – this is all a fake dream that he came up with. And I was like, well, oh what a pretty sure he just gets tuberculosis, right? Isn't that what really happens? 
Because at, at the end, he gets like pneumonia and it's like he gets like TB and it ends up in like quarantine for a week or something. I think that's how it fucking ended. I, I wasn't really paying attention. But people were saying that he's actually in a mental institution and uh, the whole thing was like the Joker, like it was a figment of the imagination. Maybe you don't know. <sighs> you get a lot of uh, just random talk about like society at the time and. What Salinger was really trying to say. And whenever you tell the author what they're really trying to say, I just want to punch you in the mouth. Like, ask the fucking yeah. author what he was trying to say. No doubt. It's, it's, um, and that's something good, you know, I, cause I did have an actual constructive conversation with a uh, catcher in the rye, uh, uh, somebody who likes it. And, you know, she was saying, you know, um, to contest one of my points, I don't remember which one I don't have them in front of me, but she's like, uh, you're, you're only going to see it as shallow if, or pe- essentially the, the thing was, um, you, you only see as much meaning in something as you want to see in it. So it's like, if you think something's deep, you're going to find a reason to make it deep and therefore it's going to become deep to you it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's yeah. like oh yeah i i love this book and now i have to come up with a reason it's like yeah i mean you really don't i i enjoy you know reading lord of the flies it's a dim book and i can obviously plumb the depths with it and everything but at the surface i think it's just a great story and i'm i'm fine leaving it there i don't need to find some sort of religiosity in this which I feel like a lot of people are doing. It's like, oh, I need to build my life on Holden Coffee. It's like, you really don't. Yeah, you don't. that's how you end up shooting really John don't. Lennon or something fucking stupid. <laughs> it's like, come on now. Well, that's like The come Road. On. When I, I got done reading that, I was reading about, uh, I was reading some of the reviews and stuff. And people were digging into that book really deeply. And I'm just thinking to myself, it's just a fucking post-apocalyptic wasteland that a guy and his kid are walking through and they're fighting off cannibalism. Other than the relationship between father and son, which was very terribly done, I think, um, <laughs> I I don't really see any deeper meaning in that book. Other than when things go bad, people, some people tend to, instead of sticking together, they just start killing everybody. That's all I got. People are going deep into that about, you know, post-war America and like just all kinds of dumb shit. And I was like, again, that, that, that's not even in the book. You're Especially like a Cormac McCarthy a guy like that, and even like a J.D. Salinger probably, like I haven't read his other work, but I would feel it's kind of like the writing style isn't too, you know, steeped in metaphor or anything. Like you kind of, no. what you're reading is what you're getting with those guys. So I don't see, not e- it's not even like an old man in the sea where you can really dig deeper into what else that story means. It's, it's pretty surface level, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, I think the difference is that uh, if you look at the narration of old Ma- a book like Old Man in the Sea, it's they're they're just tones and um, literary keys as you're reading it that you're like, oh, there's a lot of emphasis being put on you know this struggle and hey, he was struggling with stuff. Old Man Santano, I think was his name. Yeah. Um, just struggling at the beginning with all this and he's remembering his life and he's wondering if there's any fight left in the world or if there's any fight left in him. And, Oh, now he's fishing. You're like, Oh, this can draw back to that. Like if there's going to be metaphor, then there has to be a setup for the metaphor. Otherwise it's just, it's like, no, you're, you're like, like what you said, it's uh, people are reading into things and then, coming up with crap that's not even in the book like insane asylum caulfield it's yeah. like i'm i'm not seeing that anywhere you know world war ii it's like i mean it takes place in the 40s 50s era so it's obviously like during or after world war ii i'm not seeing there, there's no mention he's from an upper class family so he yeah what's have the metaphor anyway. what's the metaphor for war there's none it's yeah, not even like there's... holden caulfield is uh fighting people or anything like there's nothing there's nothing that would signify that if anything maybe a class system how holden caulfield's the upper class so he kind of has the privilege of he can fuck up and get away with it versus yeah. when he goes and visits the prostitutes and the pimps and stuff they have to be aggressive because if they fail in whatever their endeavor is they're done like that's yeah. the most i think you could really dig into that kind of aspect <laughs> Yeah, and you can uh, to that. That's even backed up with this whole uh, thing about the suitcases, seeing the nun suitcases, and remembering that kid at like a summer camp or something like that that didn't have a nice suitcase like me. So, uh, and I always feel bad for people with bad suitcases yeah. and all this stuff. It's like <laughs> she was so stupid. It always, it always makes me so depressed. I was like, dude, I fucking like, hated that part. 
Um, I was just sitting thinking, I'm like, if you hate having all this money, just wait till you're 18, move out of your parents' house, give it all up and live as a bum. Yeah. Like it's, it's so easy. One of his uh, so main easy. reasons for rooming with Stradlater was because he had a nice, equally nice suitcase. <laughs> yeah. Come like, on. That's, that's the reason I roomed. It's like, ah, really? So that people don't hate you mm. because you come from a nice family. I, I don't know. It's, all that class stuff was something of his creation. I didn't see it as anybody else bringing it up. No. Like, it's it's like always him. He's always got to say, oh, yeah, I have a lot of dough. I have a lot of money. Oh, I got this. Oh, you don't need to worry about me because I got all this money. And I'm throwing, you know, five bucks back in, yeah. what, 1946, 1951. It's like, a what would that be like, 40 bucks 40. on a freaking vinyl here or something? And he was... So, um always talking about his dad being a lawyer and corporation he's a corporate lawyer and shit yeah and then he because he was the one that was mainly focused on that and then uh yeah none of the poor people were that well, not too many in the story but whatever, whoever poor people like they didn't really give a shit i will to switch things up a little bit though i did find there was at least a few beautiful scenes in this book beautiful is not really the word to use uh poignant maybe like the uh main one that sticks out to me is the the brief story he tells about the kid who's getting jumped in his room and then jumps out the window and gets killed. And then the teacher who he ends up uh, staying with at the end uh, is the only one who scooped up the dead kid to take him away from it. You know, everyone viewing yeah. it. Uh, that was, a, again, that was only the one of the few times where something really fucking happened in this story that was worth yeah. talking about. Uh, but then it turned out that guy was a pervert anyway, which I didn't understand. I guess that was another hit on innocence. Like, Holden innocently thought this guy just had his best interests in mind. So he calls him up and he stays with him when he's uh, hiding out from his parents or whatever. Then the guy gets blasted drunk after lecturing him all night. And then Holden wakes up to him like touching his hair and it was kind of slightly weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, – and then Holden panics. and uh, But he said – Holden says that happened to him at least 20 times. Like perverts did things to him. So I was like, wait a yeah. minute. That's not something to gloss over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I feel like more attention needs to be drawn here, man. <laughs> yeah, you're you're focusing on ducks. We need to know more about what's going on here, right? But I did feel like there was a good uh, element there. With okay, on one hand, the teacher who he really respected at first might be a nasty pedophile type pervert, but on the other hand, the, at least he cared enough. Like you know, he tried to help the kid who committed suicide. Which, I don't know if that was actually suicide. He just jumped and maybe died. It didn't really go into the details of that. Uh-oh. Hey, Nitro. Break time. How'd you get in so quietly? I didn't hear you open the door. Yeah. You're a sneaky lady. It's snowing. Oh, it's not Nitro. Okay. Is that toilet paper or paper towels? Paper towels. Oh. I see. Say hi to Ashley. Hi. He can't, or you can't hear him, I don't think. Hello. There you go. Okay. So my glasses. I see. <laughs> are you gonna make a bunch of ruckus, or are you done? <laughs> <laughs> Try to continue. I, I'm not making ruckus. Well, he is a part of the show. He's very in, integral to the the production process. The la <laughs> last episode, me and Spencer actually ended the episode when he flipped out and – not Spencer. Uh, the dogs started flipped out and started yelling at us because he wanted dinner. So we like rushed through the end while he's howling at us and it was kind of funny. So – That sounds typical of Spencer, but Nitro, yeah. that, that's how – Nitro is usually character. a good boy. Spencer, on the other hand, I can't say the same for. <laughs> he's just a goddamn phony. Yeah. Anyway, I forget where I left off, but skipping the Suicide. whole – Oh, uh, yeah, well, that fucked up part. Um, <laughs> just going back to the uh, s s another topic at hand. How did, What about the writing itself? Because we were both very critical of how this was written, but just going into the actual, not like the style and then the mechanics of the writing and the storytelling style used. What, what are your opinions on that? I, I dig the fact that he used vernacular um, very well for dialogue, for all the dialogue scenes. You kind of got to put yourself in that the mindset and the slang terminology of that era so that you're not rolling your eyes being like, oh, they said grand. Oh, that's so corny. Oh, blah, blah. That's how but they would you talk, gotta, yeah. Yeah, it's like, okay, so that that's how people talk um, at that time. So 
taking that into consideration, it came across as very believable. It came across as very fluid. Um, I liked when he had multiple people talking, he would just cut it off. Uh, like when he, I think he was arguing with Ackley at the beginning and like Ackley's like picking his nails or cutting his nails Yeah. and Ackley's like talking and he keeps like cutting and in and be like, God damn it, cut it over the freaking table or something. And so I was like, Hey, that, that actually, I can hear that in my head. Mm. Very clear narrative style. I guess it's effective and I can get the use of repetition and repetitive phrasing. I just really get annoyed reading like, oh, no, it really was. Or I really was. Or, yeah, I really did do that. I was like, he always had to cement the statement by repeating himself. And that got very tiresome. Yeah. It's like, dude, you're the narrator. I'm, I'm believing you. You don't need to try to convince me like doing it maybe one or two times to draw attention to a certain thing to where you're like, okay, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't believe him in this case. It was clearly a character trait and it's fine if. The character does that, but not every sentence. You could yeah. do it even maybe once a page if you really felt inclined, but not every fucking sentence. That was my main gripe with that, too. But, like, you were just saying about, um, you know, the, the character development. He that That's where the book really does shine. Whether you enjoyed it or not, whether you enjoyed the writing style or not, you, can't, you have to admit, when you're reading Holden Caulfield, that's Holden Caulfield. You're not thinking of Salinger. You're not thinking of... Yeah you know, superimposing yourself upon the character. Because a lot of times I read, you know, stories where I kind of become the character as I'm reading it, if that makes sense. Yeah. But with this, it's that's Holden Caulfield. That's not not you at all. That's not, you can't, however he looks, it's not going to be how you think he looks. It's, everything is there. That is a very well-developed character. Most of the characters in this book, if not all, were like that. Like Ackley, you see his gross pimples and his (laughs) awful hygiene, his gross cutting of his nails on the floor is crummy nails. Um, Stradlater, who's super handsome and conceited, you get him. Like, everybody has their place. So he did really yeah. good on the character development. Like, you also <laughs> said the um, the way the, all the characters spoke, it's, you know who's speaking, and they cut each other off. It felt like real dialogue. Yeah. Um, and then other, other than the, the constant repeating of things, it w- wouldn't have been as annoying without that. Um, mm mm-hmm. And then the narration stuff, I didn't mind it so much. I mean, he was, it was kind of stream of consciousness. He was kind of all over the place at times. But the story yeah. still did progress. It did move forward. You didn't get stuck in one stupid memory or something too long. Like, everything kind of at least had a purpose for why it was there. Except for the fucking ducks. I just don't get that <laughs> <one>. <laughs> I Yeah, I, I didn't mind the 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 meandering of thought too much. Um, there are just certain instances where, you know, if he's hanging out with somebody or doing something like that, um, and he, he, he'll be like in the middle of a conversation with a person like with Stradlatter or Ackley or Sarah or not Sarah, Sally or anyone. And he'll like stray into like a memory of like why he's thinking something. And it's based on that. I was like, see, by the time we get back to the conversation, I'm having to like really fight to remember what we were talking about before. Why is this relevant? And that's right. kind of what gave me the the impression of like, oh, maybe maybe he is like ADHD. And this is kind of mm. like his because if it if it is him telling us stuff rather than us observing him having a thought then it would be more iconic of like a, you know, a manic or an ADHD uh, sort of mentality because you're going to chase rabbit trails and then you're like going to fight to like, oh, I'm out here. Let's try to bring it full circle. <laughs> like, mm. well, that one was a little heavy hand and that was a little rough or it, uh, anything. It really does come off as a non-professional orator telling you a story. Like you yeah, get that. You yeah, get somebody that. maybe you work with who just, is telling you a story and keeps getting sidetracked with stupid nonsense that you don't care about unrelated <laughs> to the story. Because I have those conversations all the time. <laughs> Damn it, Jerry. Get on topic. Come on, man. <laughs> he also did a good job of showing Holden's obsessiveness. His upset, Maybe yep. he does have a little OCD or something because like Stradlater takes the one girl that he likes and doesn't really want to admit to liking, but he used to hang out with a lot in the Back in the day. And he's just completely throughout the whole story obsessed on whether Stradlater had sex with her and keeps trying to convince himself that that never happened. Uh, but he doesn't even believe it himself. Um, and he yeah. gets obsessed with a lot of other things. There's the scene, like you said earlier, about the uh, 
after him and Sally were skating. He's talking about Vermont. And he's very clearly screaming at the poor girl in front of everybody. And she keeps telling him <laughs> to stop screaming. And he's like, oh, who's screaming? I'm not screaming. And, like, he won't admit <laughs> yeah, these. Like- <laughs> he doesn't admit but that he's being, you know, kind of crazy. He's a madman. He says that all the time. But he doesn't want to admit it when he's actually being a madman. And then when he's in the bar, though, later, he admits that when he gets drunk or something. Things like that, he talks t- kind of loud, but then at the same time, he doesn't want to admit that he talks loud, and he asks personal questions, but he doesn't want anybody to ask him personal questions. He's just a, a selfish prick. Yeah, he. It's uh, during those uh, him talking loud sort of things. It kind of made me laugh because I can see. Um, it, if, I don't know why my mind shot to it, but it was uh, the the lovers or the haters of Catcher in the Rye because the haters are going to see it as him like being straight up in Sally's face, like screaming, or like "Let's go live in Vermont in a freaking log cabin, you, you bimbo," and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and then everyone who loves Catcher is just going to see him there, like picking his nails and being all like, <laughs> like yeah, and nonchalant, being like, "Yeah, yeah, I just I really have this dream about going up there." What? Who's shouting, Sally? You're you're just being over dramatic. You're always over dramatic. You always love every guy, and you know you talk to a bunch of phonies. And I'm like, that that's kind of how it played out in my head. I was like, I feel like I'm yelling right now. I'm not really yelling. I don't yell, but yeah, I was like, I, it's it's just it's kind of funny how a simple scene like that can also be seen in completely different ways. Yeah, a lot of people laud this book for its humor elements. Saying you know, a lot of people said it was one of the funniest books they've ever read or ever read. Some say it's not funny at all. A lot of the humor I saw, I don't like. I feel it was accidental humor. Like a lot of things I found to be funny were probably the parts that weren't supposed to be funny. Uh, and then some of the parts that there was a few parts where he, some of the things he would say were, were pretty funny, or one of the the anecdotes he tells or something was kind of entertaining. But for the most yeah. part, I found, like, some of the funniest moments were just, like, the, the fucking weird things that happened or, like, him getting beat up by the pimp. That's not supposed to be funny, but I found it hilarious. <laughs> I, I just thought it was weird. I was like, who goes in, like, what pimp walks into your room demanding five bucks and starts, It to me, the reason I laughed is because he's just describing the dude stripping. Yeah. Like, I was like, what? Takes off his belt, takes off his shirt, and his flabby stomach. I was like, "Whoa, what is this guy doing?" Like, <laughs> I don't remember the rape scene. But, uh... <laughs> it could have went very south for Holden. <laughs> oh man! And then he's crying but... like a little bitch, but he's still like yelling at the guy. <laughs> like, I'm not giving you five bucks, but he's sitting there sobbing after he got punched. Like, come on. Yeah, or no, like after he gets punched, he's on the ground and he's like holding his stomach because he's winded. And they then the the prostitute and the Maurice, uh, the pimp, they leave. And then he like pretends this whole thing. And he got head. shot. He got gut shot. And he's like, oh, I need to call Sally or whoever. And she'll stitch me up after I take an automatic gun and just blast that guy's fat stomach. And I'm like, yeah. you're thinking this as you're winded. And well, that was a very, that was a very childlike aspect of him where he creates this fantasy in his head, which a lot of teenagers do when something happens. Uh, you know, just I mean, a common good. example is your mom yells at you and you run in your room. And, oh, I'm going to run away. I'm going to pack my shit. I'm just going to run away and they're going to cry. And then you know what? I'm going to burn the house down. And, like, you just come up with these <laughs> dumbass fantasies. Uh, kids do that all the time. But that's what he did. And then he – but it's funny because he goes out and he gets hammered drunk later. And then he, while he's in the club by himself drinking – He's, he's drunk, but he's still pretending he got gut shot. He's holding his stomach as he's walking out. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, so you have a person acting like a complete child, but then also trying to act like an adult while acting like a child. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I was like, this is pretty cool. This is this is great. You've hit a good, acceptable point of drunk at that point. <laughs> yeah. I got gut shot. Like, shut up. <laughs> Holden, you need to come hang out on DPW. Just, just yeah. <laughs> have a few drinks and <laughs> just come here, come here. And the fucking audacity of this kid too. It, that another thing that was really cracking me up was that whether it was like the piano player or the owner of the club or bar owner, whoever it was, he was always asking the waiter to to call him over to have a drink with him. Like he was some big shot important guy. Yeah. And as soon as the waiter would leave, he said, "This happened like five times." He tell he's like. <laughs> You know, every time you tell somebody to give somebody a message, they never give a message to him or something. It was like he kept saying that, like he would tell the waiter to give a message to somebody, and then he knew they would never do it because he knew in his mind how stupid he sounded. It was like, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get the owner of the bar to come hang out with me. Like, no, that's not gonna happen. 
Um, <laughs> That's what I didn't get. I was like, dude, why are you asking like random cab drivers to go have a cocktail with you? Yes, yeah, like two <laughs> cab drivers to drink with them. He, uh, <laughs> like, hey, he what that, are you funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had that scene where he uh, got the, <laughs> which is also funny. The ugly chicks at the bar. There's three of them from like oh Washington or somewhere, and uh, he wanted to dance with all of them, and they were making fun of him the whole time. But he did dance with all of them, and he ended up buying all their drinks and. I think he said Cary Grant was in the bar, and they all freak out, and he because he always goes, he just makes up all these lies. And it's like you're so you're so lame, and everybody <laughs> clearly knows he's underage, but he just like when they'll ask him, well, "How old are you, kid?" and he'd be like, eighty six, like just something really stupid. Yeah. He does that multiple 20, times 22. too. Yeah, a dude, complete offshoot, non sequitur. I I just had the first time in my uh, like I don't know the last decade somebody asked me how old I was. And I was at this, uh, I just moved to a new town and uh, went to the liquor store. And she's like, oh, you want to try this uh, this new wine we got in? It's Chardonnay, it's California and everything. I was like, sure. And she like goes to hand it to me. And she's like, how old are you? And I'm like, 21, uh, 31. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, are you really? I was like, yeah, my daughter's in the car. I mean, she can yeah. wave to you. <laughs> like, I got tattoos. Like, <laughs> I'm. I just graduated high schools. I'm. I'm a young child with a full beard. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, some high school kids look older than me. I'm like, gee, freaking what? Are you like injecting cow bovine growth hormone into your face? Like, what are you doing to look so old? Hey, you don't gotta tell me. I went to inner city school, and everyone, like, at least half of my uh, class had full beards when they were in fifth grade. So <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Like, what, what is going on here? That's why we have so many uh, top-tier athletes that come from my area, because they're just grown men. They, they go from eight to grown man within two years. Like, what ha- like, they would beat up Holden Caulfield to, you know, no transgression there at all. They would openly do it. So <laughs> Just walk up to him. Take that, Caulfield. You fucking It's because my last name's Irish, isn't it? And you always want to know if I'm Catholic. <laughs> oh, Catholics always want to know if you're Catholic. Catholic. I'm like, where is this coming from? I get the nuns are Catholic, but... Like, you know okay. who I wanted to actually hear more about in this stupid story? His mm. brother, DB. That's who I really wanted to hear about his life, because he... He was a professional writer and goes to Hollywood and makes movies and seems like one of the big shots. But because he's Holden's brother, he doesn't consider him a phony, really. He he just knows that his brother's working in Hollywood just to make money. But he really would prefer his brother to continue writing his stories versus making movies. But he at least understands, which was another weird <laughs> element because Holden Caulfield hates the movies. His brother fucking makes movies. Like, what yeah, I, th- I think that's why he get he like describes his brother as prostituting himself out. Yeah. Which after I read it the third time, I'm like, wait, is he actually a prostitute? <laughs> like, That'd be interesting. I, go, I, I thought he was a writer. Oh yeah, yeah, he is a writer. Oh, okay, I see what he's doing. He's a hooker. <laughs> a hooker prostitute. A hooker prostitute. Writer person. I, I, I think I sent you this picture, but yeah, the guy on these beers I'm drinking kind of looks like Holden. Uh, yeah. He does. He's just missing his hunting cap. He it's got ears. It's just it's, does it? but it looks like uh, also one of those woodsy uh forest ranger hats. Yeah. He's wearing a tie too. Uh yeah. <laughs> so Holden Caulfield he's kind of a jerk. Um <laughs> that's what I took away from this. Before we go any further, what would your rating on a one to four is that what we do? One to four or is it one to five whiskey shots? One to five shots. One, one to five, five shots. shots. How many shots you give this one to oh, four? Oh, man. That one's... I, I, gave, guess it, it would I gave it a on... two, by the way. Just you gave it a two? I gave it you a gave two. It two. That's my Goodreads score. I give ones <laughs> to books I don't... Fi- <laughs> I give ones to books I don't finish. So I at least yeah. finish this. And again, like we we talked before we when we were first starting, like what we would take away from this. I didn't take a damn thing away from it like (laughs) in regards to my own creativity my writing process i didn't find anything i can add um the story itself i didn't really take anything away no personal messages that touched me i just took it as a a basic story there was nothing really there that i enjoyed too much it was entertaining enough that i could read it i I would not read it again two whiskey shots for caleb all right um i think Having this be my second time through, I might do one shot more. I think I'll do three 
merely because some of the observations that he makes about uh, childhood um, or some of his just like uh, flighty, his ADD or ADHD manic sort of impulses um, that really kind of resonated because I'm going through something similar. It's just you know, like the, the impulsiveness is still there. And um, I don't know. I, I found that kind of kind of interesting um, actually taking notice of it this time. So I'll do three. I'm not a huge fan of the narrating style. I think it's way too wordy. I think um, the it, it's so easy for you to read the, the blocks of narration and then read in the exact same voice all the dialogue. Yeah, I, I, I think that a lot. There, there's just not too much differentiation there. And I think I'm a personal believer that people think different than what they speak. Um, I'm way more intelligent bit. in my mind than I am when I speak. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm like 6'5 and just gorgeous in my mind. I also have a really yeah. deep voice like that put Morgan Freeman to shame. So that's in, my, <laughs> that's like, in the noggin. I'm over here sounding like Barry White. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. I also have a really big Johnson, too. I don't know if that... I mean, <laughs> In my mind, I have a big Johnson. In my in in my mind, I have like three of them, just yeah. right there. You know, I have extras. One for the, the weekends, one for holidays, one for daily use. It's, uh, Nasty. Yeah. I can control the level of hardness. <laughs> wow, well, that okay. devolved quickly. <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll go with the. I'll go with three shots. Will you at least say they're more. like the flaming mo shots from The Simpsons, where it's like cough syrup and some other shit, and you light it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> not just straight whiskey yeah, that, or or that. maybe maybe a little r- less ridiculous just bottom shelf whiskey yeah just just some of that uh what, what was his favorite drink it was what scotch and soda or something like that scotch and soda and maybe like a tom collins or something i don't remember but yeah scotch no, and soda was his go his go-to but i think also that just had to do with him being young and just that's like because he even says he orders the drink really fast so they don't even try to guess how young he is or anything. Yeah. So he just goes through and he's got some soda and that's his go-to drink probably. Because if he's like, oh, I want a Manhattan. I feel like if he said he wanted a Manhattan, that would, they would be like, oh, this guy's clearly of age with his gray hair and his baby face. and. <laughs> <laughs> but he's really thin. He doesn't eat a lot. No, At least like, that part was consistent, you know, yeah. because he didn't eat like anything other than like the two burgers at the beginning and like some, I guess he ate like Bacon and or bags and aching, and bags and aching, and aching and, 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 and bacon and eggs. Food. Wow. Yeah, but he yeah. even said like he felt bad eating all that and in front of the nuns. Yeah, and all that shit. That also might have just been a writing device to keep uh, Salinger from having to go through three days worth of time of you know most people eat multiple times a day. If your narrator doesn't really eat, you don't have to worry about stopping to say he eats or anything like that. It's um, true, and then. And you, you know, can all, maybe up his drunkenness by doing that, too. His thinness is a sign of, you know, post-World War II world where people were starving for uh, academic intellectualism and the movies just weren't giving that. So it's like the more I say, the more <laughs> convincing this becomes. <laughs> I got to stop. I'm going to have like a sect of Caulfieldisms and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, the significance of the carousel actually has to do with the Battle of Waterloo. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, it's Napoleon. Okay, yeah. let's go right there. That's what the whole gut shot had to do. Napoleon always had his arm under his coat, holding his yeah. stomach. That's actually <laughs> the signifier of that. And because God. Holden felt like he was so small, even though he was a tall, statured man, he was still a young boy, much like a Napoleon yeah. who was apparently a short man. And no, had- no, you're all wrong. This, this, this predicts the JFK assassination because. Yes, JFK was shot in the head, but it's more like a gut shot to the American people Ooh. that that's what happened. And, you know, he, w- he was given that by the pimp of society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. And his $5 whore coming in. No. It's like, geez. Actually, what this book signifies is the dependence that Americans had on Cuban cigars. And then when we went into the Cuban Missile Crisis, everyone had to smoke cigarettes, which is why Holden smokes like a fiend, but only cigarettes. He, he does smoke like a fiend. I'm like, dear God, man, that's that's some heavy stuff. You're that that's what I couldn't figure out. It's like if he's so shaken 
and I'm bringing this back to a serious tone. Um, if he's so shaken by his little brother dying of a lung disease, like, why is he smoking so much? I took it as he like, smoked more because he felt guilt and wanted to kind of subconsciously kill himself the same way his yeah, brother died. He does mention, yeah, he does mention, like, suicide. And, like, I don't remember if it was before or after uh, Maurice the Pimp, which is the most... Pimp slapped him. <laughs> the, the, the least intimidating name ever. Hi, I'm Maurice the Pimp. Um, is like I, I would have thrown myself from the window, but you know I didn't want people rubbernecking and looking at me yeah, if yeah. there wasn't somebody to cover up my body or something. I was like, well, good to know it's still all about you. And <laughs> yeah. Also, the Maurice the pimp thing, Holden had a point because he clearly said that it would only be you know the five dollars, and then she says it's ten dollars after he doesn't even do anything, and then the pimp comes and shakes him down. That was bullshit. That that guy was a phony. Bad, yeah, bad. he's a little phony. That's false advertising. They're both um, phonies. Fucking phonies. <laughs> oh, man, I had another point with stupid Caulfield. I don't remember what it was now. Uh, probably wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would have added to the conversation significantly. Uh, yeah, so mm. stupid Holden, he, uh, I don't think he's one to uh, envy nor feel bad for. Yeah, his brother died, which kind of sucks, but you're also pretty well off, so your life is not very hard. Maybe your parents yeah. are kind of distant, I can get, but you had a very close relationship with your sister uh, and your older brother, so it's not like he wasn't loved. I mean... It's 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 really, really hard. I remember the first time I couldn't, reading through this, I couldn't sympathize with anything because I'm like, okay, yeah, your brother died, but you're like freaking loaded. You're whining. You're intentionally getting kicked out of school. Your parents, like, I think his mom was trying to set him up with a psychoanalyst yeah. and stuff like that uh, after his brother's death. So it's like, well, yeah, you, you kind of freaked out. You broke all the windows and stuff. Your parents want to get you professional help. And then you shrug it off. So it's like. You know, at the same time, he, he's a kid, though. That's kind of what your natural inclination would be is to just be like, I, I don't, don't want to talk to somebody. Like, it would be hit or I mean, kid, all kids are different, but. I, that's Wait. the thing. I couldn't. I couldn't figure out when his brother died. It didn't go into great detail on the time frame because his sister was only ten in this, and it didn't seem like she was much younger when that happened. Or maybe a couple. Because the way how smart she was when she was interacting with both brothers, it seemed like she couldn't have been too young. Maybe seven, six. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. You know, one thing I did take away from this book that actually deeply affected me. How much more mm. affordable everything was back in the fucking 50s. God damn. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, oh that gosh. made me mad. Because, yeah, obviously with inflation, the prices are different. But when it came to him getting cigarettes or taking a train or a, how many multiple cab rides, everything was like a dollar. So if you even put that <laughs> to today, I could take a cab ride for like seven bucks or something. That would be amazing. Like, yeah. What's a cab ride now? $30 for going a couple blocks? Like, I don't. That, that kind of pissed me off just to know how how awful America's gotten price wise, but <laughs> that, that's a whole another topic. I, uh, that's all Holden's, that, that's, that's, uh, the Caulfield generation, man. They grew up and they, they jacked everything up. And now they're it's getting coronavirus. Oh, yeah. Everything comes full circle at some point. <laughs> <laughs> We're staying inside. Uh, <laughs> wow. That got dark fast. <laughs> it gets dark in DPW. DPW. Mm -hmm. really? After dark. After dark. <laughs> what was that like Nick at night and stuff like that? Mm, too? That was the best kind of Nick. Nick at night. Alrighty. <laughs> Closing remarks, I guess. I would imagine this is just going to be the episode. I don't think there's, we have to go into multiple episodes. I thought about breaking this up into parts, but this seems like a pretty solid conversation. So, yeah. Closing remarks. I would recommend people to actually read Catcher in the Rye because you might take away something I didn't. And again, I, I completely understand people's different views on this. And other than like the whole phony looking into it, seeing World War II and a bunch of nonsense, <laughs> I, uh, I do understand why people would enjoy this and why they can understand the kid's angst and kind of what it would be like. A growing, not necessarily, like we said, not necessarily a coming of age tale. But you do get what it's like to be a teenager, whether it's in the 50s or now. It hasn't changed too much, like that aspect yeah. of life. Obviously, technology has a different impact. But when it came to the society and everybody being phonies, 
that's all the same. That hasn't changed. And I think that's the uh, staying power of this book. The message is pretty much the same. Whether the time period changes or not, the message of people being fake, people not necessarily being caring, even if they act like they're being caring, and then also just somebody who might not feel like they could be loved or cared for just because of what happened in their past or who they are. That's that's things that still impact us all to this day. Like, we still feel that. The human condition doesn't change much. It's just the time period changes. Yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd agree with all that. And I think um, uh, I'd recommend people to read it because of uh, cultural significance in our, our uh, American culture. It's still extremely young if you compare it to, like, England and France and China and all them. It's like we got 200 years. You got to scrape together what you can. And yeah. um, I, I love it or hate it, Catcher in the Rye is culturally significant. To America, I don't think Salinger would have wanted that to happen because he seemed like a pretty quiet dude Recluse, that didn't want of. a lot of attention. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, so he was an actual writer. You know um, what I would like to see? How would this book play out read by the European audience, the Russian audience, the Japanese audience, you know, other mm-hmm. other countries that haven't had the American experience? Because this is very pro-World War II America. And a oh, lot yeah. of cut like Europe was not at all like us at the time period. Like they were rebuilding. Mm. Clearly, Russia was pretty fucked up at the time period. So I, I just <laughs> Japan. Jap- don't even get started on Japan. I mean, they they had to rebuild their whole culture. So mm-hmm. I would be really interested to see what folks from those countries thought of the Catcher in the Rye. I bet you they would not give one solid hooey about it. They would not yeah. give a, a single fuck probably. I, I think all the uh, the ardent disciples of Caulfieldism are strictly American. And, uh, well, I mean, we got tons of listeners in, like, what, South Africa and Australia. Pakistan and all that. Yeah. Australia. So it's like if, if – We got a lot in the U.K. now, so I would uh, – hopefully I can – maybe some of my U.K. buddies have a conversation in the future if they even read this yeah, book. Yeah, that'd be – Doesn't seem popular in those countries. I never hear anybody talking about them, but – Again, this isn't a book I go to my way to be like, hey, did you read Catcher in the Rye? I never gave a fuck before, so. <laughs> yeah, it'd be it'd be super interesting to hear um, what other cultures think, because this is an extremely cultural book. It's not uh, it's not something that can just translate as easy as maybe a Tom Sawyer or something yeah. like that, to where it's like, oh, this is boyhood, this is childhood right here, and a bunch of boys being, you know, Well, if you go into, like, Japanese culture... It's very communal. It's about how everyone feels. So they would hate Holden Caulfield's guts. He's he'd be so selfish, and like they would probably hate this book. In the UK, I would think it would be they'd have a little soft reviews, but with the whole whiny and angsty bullshit, like the UK is very you know the stereotype stiff upper lip. I think they would also hate the character for being so <laughs> open with his emotions and talking about the themes that he does because in the uk like that's one of those places where bullying like people say you like hey i want to be a famous shoe designer when i grow up people will be like no you can't do you need to be an accountant like they shit on you openly (laughs) about trying to do things that aren't normal and uh it's very indicative indicative of uh british culture so that would be interesting to see there and then russia i mean come on with the hardships russia has gone through especially in that time (laughs) period i don't see them uh (laughs) <laughs> relating to Holden Caulfield either, Mr. I can just flunk out of five schools. And then if you go to Africa or even some Middle Eastern countries where education is like, you know, gold, your your, gold, gar- yeah. your school is a fucking, you know, outdoors, one chalkboard with no chalk. Like they would re- <laughs> they would really hate Holden Caulfield, I would think, because he's so spoiled. Yeah, it's uh, holding him in high esteem like so many – so many of his disciples do, I think is uh, a huge mistake for the average reader to make. I don't think, I think you're meant to sympathize with certain areas of him while also condemn other areas because he's supposed to be a person, not a messiah. Mm -hmm. It's like, he's, you can, you can be like, oh shoot. Yeah. I've lost family members or, oh shoot. Yeah. I, you know, I struggle with, uh, you know, if, if you do see the, the bipolar or the, the ADHD or whatever in there, you can be like, oh yeah, I totally, I, I can resonate with that. But you're also throwing away so many opportunities. You're just going out of your way to be a yeah. jerk. <laughs> you're talking to girls and saying, oh, you, re- you know, you really chat my ass and all this stuff. It's like, ah, you, you just need a good butt whooping yeah. from another Maurice pimp. 
<laughs> well, to piggyback <laughs> off of you, the themes of uh, the themes of loss, grief, guilt, you know, even just growing up, these are all relatable things. So to that aspect, yeah, you can relate to Holden Caulfield. But the everything else, I, I don't, I don't really see it. Maybe if you're like no. a well-to-do kid who's going through a similar thing, this might be right up your fucking alley. <laughs> and that'd be another thing. I would actually like to, if we could ever get back to civil conversations with people on Twitter, which won't happen. I would like to uh, <laughs> see how many of those people that really like this book were grew up more well off, because mm-hmm. I did not grow up well off. I was very poor class. So seeing like this kid, I would just want to punch him in the face. Uh, oh yeah. Growing up, like I would, I had no opportunities like this kid, so I could not, I can't relate at all. But if somebody, you know, went to a private school, or even if they were just middle class, and maybe they had a maid like Holden Caulfield, come on, I mean, if once soon as you get a fucking maid, I feel like you can't bitch too much about life. It's like you, you can still go through hard stuff, but I don't think you have. Uh, with all the resources available for helping to cope with that grief, because it's like, what what super poor kid's going to be able to afford therapy after their yeah their freaking kid brother dies? What 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 kid's going to be able to afford getting kicked out of like five private schools to just and, because and he was, all didn't want to do the work? Yeah, it's like, I mean, come on, dude. It's it. I can't sympathize with that at all because it's like you you put in the work, you do it so that you can get through it right the first time. And if you want to screw up your life as an adult, go for it. But, I mean, you have all these opportunities, all these resources. Your parents are, like, lavishing you with all this money and all that. It's like, you don't just waste that. Even if you hate yourself, it's like, at least donate to charitable cause, which yeah. I guess he Kinda donated does, yeah. to nuns. But it's like, you still saved enough money to go on a date with Sally. Yeah. I, think this, <laughs> I think this story would have had a bigger impact. If maybe they explain that Caulfield's home life wasn't so great. Like if his dad was like an alcohol, he could have been well to do. But if his dad was an alcoholic or his mom had, because she was kind of neurotic, but not to the point where it would really impact the, their lives too much. Like she was just a nervous person. But if they made it maybe like a one of those things where she always thought her kids were sick or like really was too protective, like a helicopter parent. Those, yeah. I can, that would make the story, I feel... Like Holden Caulfield situation, more I don't want to say respectable, but understandable. Sympathetic, yeah, yeah, sympathetic because you could obviously be well to do and have a really really shitty life. You could grow oh, yeah. up to rich parents who completely ignore you and you never see them, and you're isolated and lonely and act out and you lash out at your environment because of it. That is, un- I, I can relate to that, even though I'm not well to do. But Holden Caulfield didn't have that. It, most of his parents yeah. were. Too understanding. Oh, you dropped out of another school. We're going to yell at you, but not have any consequences. Like, come yeah. on. Yeah. And, and when he would describe his mom about being like, I don't, I don't think he used the word neurotic, but as being he sort said of paranoid nervous. about him. Yeah. Nervous. There you go. Um, I was like, well, yeah, she's, she's probably, she has trauma as well from losing one of her own children. You lost a brother. She, she lost, lost a, child. a child, dude. Like that's, <laughs> that's a bigger thing it's completely different uh, i mean but it's still you lose a child i can't even imagine losing one of my kids that what psychological impact that have on me so well, his sister and older brother weren't acting like assholes because of it yeah i mean i guess it maybe is just because his age range but still like you said he doesn't think about anybody else he doesn't think about his, how his mom feels about it he doesn't think how it would yeah. impact his father mm-hmm the, the, obviously, these characters would have their own motivations, but the way it was explained in the book, these people are just kind of side characters. They just go about their day, and it's really all about him. Yeah, it's um, and and that's another reason why I think it fails as a coming of age story is because he's not sympathizing with anyone. It's he's very closed off. It's the Caulfield universe, and you know Caulfield's at the center of it. And oh, he can he can sympathize and feel sorry for other people and these imaginary scenarios that he creates in his head of like, oh, you know, all these suitcases. And it's like, maybe the person just likes that suitcase. You ever think about that? (laughs) Maybe maybe they don't give a damn about the suitcase. Maybe they have bigger things going on in their life, but it's, he, he's so self-centered. It's, and all children 
that that's a defining characteristic of adolescence and childhood is you are very very self-centered that's why you have to teach kids hey you need to share how would this make the other person feel these are lessons we teach our kids because it's not inherent it's it's something you learn as you grow older to become a better more respectable kind uh citizen human being whatever verb ad yeah. verb noun prefix whatever well the better version of what you just described is again tom sawyer yeah tom mm. sawyer is very selfish but he also cares about everyone around him he uh yeah. you know when he does something very selfish and then it comes to him getting in trouble or something he feels very upset about how his aunt his aunt's feeling or how his yeah. friends feel or whoever he wronged he is selfish because he's more thoughtless than anything like a kid Kids are thoughtless. That's why they're selfish. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. because they're being malicious. It's not like they think, oh, I'm more important than this person. They just think that – they don't think. They just act and, you yeah. know, Tom, he's he's thinking about, uh, I want to go play pirates. That would be fun. He doesn't really think that, oh, if I go missing for a day, my <laughs> aunt is going to be uh, upset. The town's going to be upset. And then he has the child fantasies of, okay – well, now they're like when it dawns on them. Okay, yeah, they're gonna be upset, but we'll make a grand return and everyone will be happy. Holden Caulfield yeah. would be like, "I want them to all think I'm dead and I will never return." And like he doesn't <laughs> care about how they think if he returned, like about them being happy. That's not in his thought process. He's just yeah. selfish and doesn't care about anybody else's feelings. And, and that's the thing. It's like um, there, there was an example where uh, in Tom Sawyer, when um, what's a girl? I can't think of her name. Uh, the girl he likes uh, tears a page in the, like the teacher's favorite book or something. Yeah. And he and takes he the sees, blame for it. He, he like jumps in and takes blame for it. Even he I mean, he gets his butt handed to him, even though she like, just set him up to get him in trouble, which I don't exactly. think I, if I remember correctly, he didn't even know that that, that it was her doing. But still, he did the right thing. Just because he, yeah, didn't, he, he didn't want her to be, he didn't want her to feel bad or get beat or in trouble, even though at the time they were having disagreements. Holden Caulfield would probably be like, yeah, fuck that bitch. <laughs> like, yeah. She's in trouble now. You're, phony. You're a phony. Phony. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot that could be, we could do probably like five episodes on comparing Tom Sawyer to we should just did Tom. We should have just did Tom Sawyer. <laughs> Yeah, that was so, it was so. I did not when I read that. I really went because I've been putting it off for a long time. I really went into it thinking that I'm going to be kind of bored because of the the time period, and I'll get something out of it. But I'm probably not going to enjoy it that much. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was like I couldn't sleep because I kept reading it. It was a page turn. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, how's this going to end? What's going to happen here? I really want to read Huckleberry Finn now because that that you know obviously Mark Twain was super great writer. Um, yeah. super great writer guy, but JD Salinger is catcher in the rye. If he had a sequel, I would be like, I'm not gonna read that. I don't care to yeah, find out what like, happens if the Holden is an adult. Or nah. Don't give a fuck. <laughs> nah, I'm good on Holden Caulfield unless you're telling me like he, he's like on his deathbed remembering stuff accurately, or it's interviewing everyone else around him at the yeah. exact time but like i'd be interested to hear what his friends and his family say about those like what was it four or five days that he was just wandering around aimlessly in new york it's like ah i'd love to see their point of view yeah catcher in the rat is kind of stupid <laughs> i don't understand though why it's so popular i can get why people would like it and why it have a cultural impact at the time but wh- why is it still mandatory reading at this point there's a lot better examples of the themes in this book in other books um, yeah. So that's what I'll, I'll leave you guys with that. That's the, the, the themes in this book. You, I'll recommend reading it just once. Again, though, that's with most classic books, just to say you did. But uh, it's a quick read. You can, you'll you'll fly right through it. It took me like what a couple hours. But I still say that uh, Holden Caulfield kind of sucks. And if you want a hilarious rendition of Holden Caulfield, watch the very terrible movie Bindle Stiffs. Uh, <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, that's uh. Smodcast production. It, I don't know five, five to ten years ago it was made. But the main story of that is three friends. One who reads Catcher in the Rye and it, or wants to. Yeah, I think he reads Catcher in the Rye in class, and then the book's banned, and he becomes obsessed with it. He starts wearing the dumb hunting hat. It's a complete satire on how shitty Catcher in the Rye is, 
And yeah. So he's going like through the, the same thing. But the whole movie is kind of an awful satire. It's pretty much how Catcher in the Rye, how you would have liked to see it playing out. Uh, again, <laughs> terrible movie, but just like Catcher in the Rye, probably worth one, you know, one watch. You just, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you folks want to check out our fiction, which isn't as angsty, or is it? You have to find out by going to uh-huh. drunkenpenwriting.com. You can check us out on Twitter at Drunk Pen Writing, Instagram and Facebook, Drunk Pen Writing. Um, it was a pleasure having you on DPW After Dark. Uh, <laughs> I hope I Ooh, hope you sultry. took something away from this episode. And if that is stay sexy, that's what you should take away. Mm. <laughs> Baby. All right, yeah. folks. Uh, yeah, see you later. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>